Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining this Regary Financial webinar. We're, we're very excited to have this uh, be kicked off here with one of our partners, Alpha Star Capital Management. So that way you don't have to just hear my voice the whole time. You guys will get a little break, and you're actually going to have two other presenters come on. Again, my name is Logan Sadler with Regary Financial. In this webinar, we're going to be going over some of our different investment options we have, not only on the insurance side, but also on the investment management side. So we're very excited to bring this to you. Um, over the next few weeks, we're going to be rolling out some different topics uh, in the webinar space on retirement income, some other tax workshops. So we're very excited to be doing that, as well as doing some of these with market content from our partners over at AlphaStar. Um, as you guys know, we've been in the investment planning business for over 20 years at Regary Financial. We've had the luxury of helping over 1,200 clients plan for retirement. And we take every we take every client we plan with very seriously and as an honor to be able to help them with their planning process. As you guys know, Hugh Regary has been in the business for over 30 years in financial planning. And when, when him and our firm was looking around for investment firms to work with, we wanted to bring somebody to the table that offered the same values we did as far as service and transparency. Because those are things that are very important to us over here at Regary Financial. And while we're looking around, we got to look at a lot of different companies, but we ended up settling with AlphaStar Capital Management. And we couldn't be more excited to be working with AlphaStar Capital Management. Today, you're gonna to get a little bit more of an in-depth view from our partners over at AlphaStar and what their role is and what our role is as your advisor. Um, we're really gonna do a good job of trying to show you the difference and show you the value that we both, we both bring to your, to your investment planning process. So, as comprehensive financial planners, we know, most of you guys know, with the extreme volatility going on in the market, most of Regary Financial's clients know we offer insurance-based products and annuities, but not everybody knows we also offer market investments. So that's what we're gonna cover today, um, and we're gonna go pretty into depth into one of our most known models, the Beta Shield. Uh, we're very happy with how the Beta Shield has performed and how it has uh, done its job as far as a risk management approach. Today, you're going to get the option to the chance to hear directly from the company that helped create the Beta Shield. Okay, so you're going to get an in depth look at that, as well as you're going to get a full overview of what has been going on in this COVID 19 pandemic. Tony Parrish, AlphaStar's chief investment officer, is going to go into depth on the market, the market events we've been seeing due to this COVID 19 and kind of what we are going to continue to see here on out for the next, for the next short term future. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to introduce Tony Parrish from AlphaStar Capital Management. He is their chief investment officer. He serves as their firm's investment, head of their firm investment committee. What his job is, is he handles all of AlphaStar's models, as well as the money manager partnerships. So he does a very good job of, of coming out with new models, as well as managing the ones they have and kind of going through the different holdings. And when someone it comes to investments, Tony is somebody you want in your team, and we're very happy to be partnered with him an alpha star. Uh, he brings uh, his years of experience to the table as working with, prior to this, working with Sage Investments, helping manage over $12.5 in assets. So we're pretty excited to have him on our team. Uh, he joined Alpha Star back in 2019. And in my opinion, he's been nothing but, nothing but a great value for us to have on our, as part of our Regary team. Uh, the other one we're going to be introducing, who's going to be kind of taking over as my as the host here, so that way you don't have to hear me ramble on, is going to be uh, Brooks Riley over at Alpha Star Capital Management. And uh, Brooks has been with us at Regary Financial, and we've been working with him since the very start. Uh, we've been with Alpha Star now about three years. We've been working with them, and Brooks has been our go-to guy over at Alpha Star since the start. Um, anything we need, uh, Brooks handles for us. He gets either if I have a question on what a client what type of options we have for this client. Brooks either helps me with that or gets me in the right direction to help get the full uh, process going for that client. Uh, Brooks is the uh, Vice President Advisor Consultant over at AlphaStar. What his main job is, he helps advisors and firms help create a productive uh, advisory business. So I, I can say from our, from, from our point of view, Brooks has been nothing but a value to us, not only myself, but Gary Financial and to all of our clients. Um, and if, uh, if you're already a Regary Financial client, you probably have either got a chance to talk to Brooks or met him at one of our client events. He's actually came out for those as well. So his voice may sound familiar. Um, and again, he's going to take over as the co-host here 
and we're very excited to have this webinar come to you. You're going to get a great in-depth look from Tony Parrish and Brooks Riley directly from AlphaStar. So Tony and Brooks, why don't you guys go ahead and take it away and uh, you guys enjoy. We're in for a treat. All right. Thanks, Logan. You know, we're real honored to be here. Um, we appreciate the invite and uh, being able to speak on this webinar. Hopefully it shares some, uh, some valuable information with everybody. Thanks for, to the participants um, for logging in. Uh, this is Brooks Riley. I'm coming to you live quarantined in my living room in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, as Logan mentioned, I head up one of the advisor consulting teams over at AlphaStar, helping advisors um, really just learn and build an efficient and well-run advisory practice, um, helping them out with model selection and financial planning process and things of that nature. Um, so I'm going to act as your host tonight, let Tony do uh, most of the important speaking, because as you'll see, he's got a lot of good information to share. Um, so a couple uh, important disclosures here. I just want to run through and share this slide. Um, our goal this evening is to provide you with some relevant information and educational content. Um, this is not an offer or a solicitation to purchase any specific securities or investment strategies. Um, so an overview for the webinar here. Um, we're going to hear from Tony about what he's seeing and, you know, most importantly, what he's paying attention to in the current market environment and what that means moving forward. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the fundamentals of wealth management, um, how they relate to a financial plan and building your wealth. And then finally, um, we're gonna discuss the beta shield strategy, which is a proprietary investment strategy that AlphaStar Capital Management developed and offers to clients. Um, we're gonna look at that in detail, see how it works, what it's good for, um, how it may possibly fit into your financial plan. Um, so now I will hand it over to Tony uh, to give you his insights on the current market environment. All right, thanks Brooks, thanks Logan, and thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, the slides that you will see in this presentation are uh, recent. Uh, they're about three weeks old. Today is May the 6th that we're recording this. Now, normally three weeks um, of uh, lag wouldn't be a big deal. In fact, material information doesn't change all that much in three weeks time under normal circumstances. But as you know, these are not normal circumstances. The big uh, event, of course, in 2020, maybe even the big event in uh, this decade, uh, when we look back on things is of course, what is going on with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and this is something that, you know, it's, it's a biological threat, it is an economic threat, and it's certainly a threat to investment portfolios globally. This is a snapshot on your screen of the Johns Hopkins um, uh, Center for System Science and Engineering. They have been monitoring the COVID-19 outbreak. And as of, uh, you see on the bottom left corner, this was a snapshot that we took on the 14th of April, about three weeks ago. Total confirmed cases globally were about 1.9 million. Uh, if we look at that snapshot today, the 6th of May, we see that uh, the global total is about 3.7 million. That means 1.9 to 3.7 million. That number has almost doubled in the last three weeks. Um, and keep in mind, that number has almost doubled with all of the stay-at-home orders and the lockdown provisions uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, of course, now uh, beginning of May, moving into the middle of May, we are starting to ease those uh, stay-at-home orders uh, state by state. Um, and I, I firmly believe that we will have uh, cases of conf uh, you know, confirmed infections uh, spiking from here on out. Um, it may be morbid to look at things like, um, you know, the confirmed cases or the death toll. Uh, you know, certainly this is a, a human tragedy. Uh, it is affecting the markets. And as a matter of fact, if we can go to the next slide, we see that when the um, coronavirus um, pandemic really started to play out in February, um, the markets really started to sell off. This is a price chart of the S&P 500. Uh, starting at the beginning of this year, you see that in around the third week of uh, February, um, prices began to go down and really bottomed out uh, on around the 23rd of March. That bottoming out really um, 
Well, the, the decline uh, was driven by concern about the spread of this pandemic globally. Um, the S&P 500 dropped to about uh, 2,800. I'm sorry, dro dropped to uh, about uh, 2,200 at that time. And then, uh, you know, this was largely driven by uncertainty about, you know, how bad the virus would get, how broadly it would spread, how um, much of an economic impact there would be, what the human toll would be, how long it would last, how long it would take to get a vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty going on and the markets don't like uncertainty. So uh, they dropped precipitously. Uh, this was the fastest drop from, uh, you know, from uh, a high level into bear market territory since the uh, since Black Monday, really the flash crash of the, of the 1980s. Um, but then something changed. Something changed on the 23rd or 20, starting on the 24th of February, and the markets began to climb. You see this uh, chart ends on around the 14th of April. But if we flash forward to today, uh, May 6th, we see the S&P 500 is currently uh, at around 2870. So pretty much where this chart left leaves off, it's basically been flat for the last three weeks. And we have to, have to ask ourselves, uh, we, you know, since we know what caused the big drop, it was uncertainty surrounding the pandemic, what was it that caused the big rebound? Did we suddenly you know, wake up one morning and say that we are in uh, you know, all systems go? No, that wasn't the case. Essentially, we had very swift and comprehensive action from the Fed and from legislators in Washington. Let's go to the next slide, please. So on the next slide, we see uh, this is the uh, legislative response to the pandemic. This was, as of a few weeks ago, um, uh, you know, the, the House and the Senate quickly passed the CARES Act. It was signed into law that uh, allocated $2.2 trillion of relief, including direct payment to households, $500 billion uh, to the Federal Reserve's activities, $349 billion to the SBA program for small businesses, $340 billion in emergency funding that mostly went to states and local governments, et cetera. So that was the fiscal response. And since that time, there's been another uh, phase four relief bill that was signed into law. That's an additional $484 billion, primarily focusing on small business loans, hospitals, and expanded COVID testing. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Previous slide showed the, um, the um, fiscal response. This slide lists some of the monetary responses undertaken by the Federal Reserve. Uh, if you look at what the Fed did in, starting in March and continues to this day and will continue for you know, a prolonged period of time, measured in at least months, possibly quarters, is uh, the Fed took several pages from its 2008 financial crisis playbook. It lowered the federal funds target rate close to zero, authorized security purchases, including treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. It allocated up to $2.3 trillion in loans to support households and employers in the financial markets, as well as state and local governments. And it set up currency swap facilities with other central banks. That last one is often overlooked. Um, basically, you know, the global capital markets primarily transact in U.S. dollars. And if you're in New Zealand or you're in Finland or you're in Argentina or any place around the world and you want to be able to conduct business in the global markets, you need access to dollars. So what the Fed did was set up currency swap facilities with other central banks to allow other banks to pledge their currency as collateral. Let's say, uh, you know, European countries to pledge the euro, Japan to pledge the yen, um, you know, uh, the Danes to pledge the Danish corona as the case may be, and then they would be able to use that collateral to receive uh, U.S. dollars, basically borrow in dollars that they could use to help uh, for their transactions. All of these activities by the Fed really helped to keep the uh, biological crisis from spreading into a credit crisis. Um, and thank goodness, I mean, I never thought I'd say this, but thank goodness for 2008 and the financial crisis, it basically provided the Fed with its um, playbook that it was able to deploy very quickly this time around. So all of these things, uh, the fiscal and the monetary stimulus activities, or shall I say relief activities, um, really helped the markets to, um, to, to bounce back. Let's go to the next slide, please. Of course, we continue to have a lot of concerns from an economic standpoint. 
Um, this was the um, a slide of the four week average jobless claims. Again, this was just a few weeks ago. I needed to create a red box and a red arrow pointing to the line on the right hand side of this chart to ensure that people didn't miss the fact that there was this gigantic spike in the number at the far right extreme of this chart. It basically shows uh, jobless claims. We know that as of today, over 30 million people have applied uh, for jobless claims uh, since the pandemic began. Uh, we're also expecting uh, consensus forecasts, uh, another 3 million plus uh, in the jobs report that's due to be released tomorrow on May 7th. That'll be 33, 34 million people on top of the, uh, uh, let's call it 3.5% unemployment rate before this pandemic. We are experiencing a jobs crisis. Uh, throw that into the mix. There are lots of um, downgrades and foreclosures and layoffs and businesses going you know, under. And all of this creates a very significant and, and worrisome economic environment. Um, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, is uh, projecting a budget deficit of $3.7 trillion uh, for fiscal 2020. And that doesn't even include the uh, phase four relief bill, that half a billion dollars that was um, signed into law a couple of weeks ago. Our debt to GDP ratio as a country is, over, is projected to be over 100%. Uh, in other words, we have more debt than we have, uh, that our debt is larger than the size of our economy, <laughs> basically. Um, so this is a very worrisome situation economically, but let me break it down in the following way. This may sound very cold and heartless, but I believe it is true. The markets ha are holding up right now because the markets are willing to accept large losses in life. 100,000 uh, people dying, 200,000 people dying in this country alone, whatever the final death toll is. The markets are willing to accept the loss of life but the markets would not be willing to accept the loss of spending. I know it sounds cold. Markets can overlook 100 to 200,000 deaths so long as the economy keeps working. And based on the activities of uh, legislators to, to keep uh, supplying relief to consumers and businesses and the activities of the Fed to continue providing credit and, and making sure that the credit markets and, and capital markets continue to have a lot of liquidity, then the markets are pricing in essentially a, a neutral standpoint that suggests that um, an optimism that the economy will stay afloat until we have a breakthrough uh, in, the, in, in a positive direction. Next slide, please. So that kind of summarizes some of the things that, that we, I wanted to talk about. Our team is looking at today, essentially, the pandemic caused a tremendous amount of uncertainty. The uncertainty was in many ways mitigated by fiscal and monetary relief activities. And now the markets are pricing in a relative optimism, or I should say a neutral outlook, based on the premise that ongoing liquidity and relief activities from uh, Washington will buy us time until we can have positive breakthroughs in terms of the pandemic's effect on the economy, and on uh, consumers. So let me stop there and move on to the next section. Yeah, I appreciate that, Tony. Um, next, we're gonna dive in to, you know, take a look at the building blocks of wealth management. Uh, what are some of the more important concepts when you approach the topic of building wealth? Great, yeah. So um, in terms of building blocks of wealth, uh, we have a, uh, a, a uh, quote here on the screen. Asset allocation explains about 90% of the variability of a fund's returns over time. That was from a, a famous uh, study by Roger Ibbotson and Paul Kaplan years ago. Um, and you know, so many investors look at the world in terms of trying to time the markets. They say, is it a good time to invest or a bad time to invest? They turn on the TV and the talking heads are telling them, buy, 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 or sell, 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 or whatever the case may be. I view the world as uh, it's much better to do systematic investing rather than market timing. In order to successfully time the markets, you actually need to uh, have six things go right if you're gonna come out ahead. 
You need to know what to sell, you need to know when to sell, and you need to know how much to sell. On top of that, you can't just sit in cash after you've sold, you then need to know what to buy, when to buy, and how much to buy. And if you get any one of those six things wrong, it could totally blow your strategy out of the water. Rather than trying to time the market, I say, go with a better approach, and that is embrace systematic investing, which essentially says, work with your advisor, work with Logan, work with a professional, and establish a plan, a financial plan that is tailored to your specific goals and risk preferences. And based on that plan, you should make sure that you have something in place that will be your blueprint for how you should be invested regardless of what the market environment entails. Let's go to the next slide, please. I break down the building blocks of wealth into three broad character, uh, categories, stocks, bonds, and insurance products. I'm simplifying somewhat. Insurance products here we're calling annuities. And of course there are other types of investments, but these in my mind are the fundamental building blocks of each. So for stocks, what's the purpose and what, are, what is the cost? Well, the purpose of investing in stocks is to grow your assets. Um, we wanna make sure that we have stocks that appreciate in value. And I think if we click on the slide, that should populate that next box. Accumulation of capital is what we're looking to do here. But there is a cost, and the cost, as we're seeing in 2020, the cost is there is a risk of sustaining losses by investing in stocks. What about bonds? People often believe that the purpose of bonds primarily is to generate income. But I believe in this era of ultra low interest rates that we've been in for the last 10 years and will likely be in for the foreseeable future, I believe that the purpose of bonds is to provide diversification relative to the stock portfolio. Basically to have something that goes up when the stock market goes down, or in the words of the author Nassim Taleb, to be anti-fragile, right? The opposite of fragile isn't, uh, isn't robust, the opposite of fragile is anti-fragile. In other words, when we have volatility, we don't want something that just holds up. We want something that actually increases in value. And that's what high quality investment grade bonds offer to a portfolio. However, there's a cost, and that cost is in the form of low income. It's almost like you accept low income as if you're paying a, an insurance premium for a policy, a health insurance policy that you hope never to have to use. But if you get sick and have to go to the hospital, you want to know that you have it. That's the analogy I would use for bonds. And then there's annuities. What's the purpose of annuities? Well, the purpose is really goal-based. It has some kind of defined outcome. Uh, could be to generate guaranteed income. Could be to um, you know, track a broad um, uh, market index or whatever the case is. There are a lot of specific purposes. But there are also costs uh, to owning annuities. And they are one in the form of an opportunity cost. If you invest too much in annuities, you may forego the ability to accumulate wealth over the course of your investment lifetime. Um, you also have some liquidity constraints. If you need to get out, let's say you have a life event that requires you to raise capital quickly, your annuities may not be liquid enough to provide that, um, that uh, liquidity that you may need. So understanding all of these, uh, uh, these uh, investment types and their uh, purposes and their costs will allow us to intelligently build uh, the right portfolio for every investor. Let's show the other bullets on this uh, page as well, please. The role of bonds, I believe, is largely misunderstood, as I said earlier. Stocks plus bonds combined can be very effective, and adding annuities to those stocks and bonds, which I call additional tools, will provide an overall better, better experience. Let's go to the next slide, please. Perfect, Tony. I just wanted to cut in real quick and just kind of yep. outline this slide because I think it's I think it's really a very important concept because um, you, you're constantly hearing in the investment management world about diversification, um, and I always like to make the uh, comparison to when you're at the grocery store shopping for food and you have the choice between uh, to to purchase something organic. Um, I think a lot of people. Uh, don't really understand what it means, but they think it is probably better for them. Um, so I just want you to, you know, really dive into what diversification means in a portfolio and why that concept is really so important. 
Sure. When you have a diversified portfolio, it means that you did not use any pesticides to build that portfolio. <laughs> no, that was, that was my lame attempt at humor. I apologize to all the listeners. Um, yes, uh, diversification is one of those buzzwords that's often tossed around and everyone nods their heads thinking that it's generally a good thing. But often people really lack the fundamental understanding of why we believe that diversification is important. So on this slide and the next slide, we have a hypothetical example. This is hypothetical only. On the left-hand side, we have a an example of a stock or an equity position. And on the right hand, we have a bond position. The blue bars show what happens when there's a, a bull market in stocks. So the, the stock goes up by 6%, the bond goes down by 1%. Um, and then the gold bars show what is, what is representing a bear market. The stock goes down 4% and the bond goes up 3%. That bond is anti-fragile. It does the opposite of what the stock does. So we see that if we have a bull market and we own stocks, we do well. But if we have a bear market and we own stocks, we do poorly. And if we have a bull market and we only own bonds, we do poorly. And if we have a bear market, we do well. The point is, we don't know. People don't know when we're going to have a bull or bear market. Nobody has that crystal ball. You tell me the, the people back in January of this year who said that we're going to be down 35% in the S&P 500 uh, by the third week of March. The number of people that said that were zero. Nobody knows when we will have a bull or bear market. So what do we do? We use diversification. Uh, so the next slide shows the exact same things, but we've added a third column. Left-hand side is the stock. The middle uh, column uh, is the bond. And the far right column is basically a 40-60 blend. 40-60 blend is 40% stock, 60% bond. We see now in a bull market, the portfolio is up almost 2%. And in a bear market, the portfolio is up marginally. Let's call it rounding to zero, but certainly not down. Diversification in the form of combining these two securities has illustrated why we like um, combining um, securities that don't move in tandem with one another. Why do we combine them? Well, we combine them because they give us better protection against losses. Now, is there a cost? Of course there's a cost. You see that the blue bar is not as high in that 4060 column as it would have been in the stock column. And the gold bar is not as high in the 4060 column as it would have been in the bond column. But that's okay. We're giving up some of the upside for the sake of protecting against the downside. That's why we like diversification. This chart shows all of the uh, corrections, peak to trough, uh, going all the way back to, uh, I think this went as far back as the 1989 market. 1990 was the, um, was the earliest uh, uh, instance here. Basically what we're doing is we're saying, uh, we're tracking the, all of those gray lines track um, 65 days prior to the trough, to the bottom, and 65 days after the trough. Uh, the reason we don't have the 2020 correction in here is because we don't have enough data yet. The dark blue line just shows the average of all of those stock corrections, and you see it's kind of in the form of a V. And then that dotted line along the bottom shows what the, the aggregate bond index did on average during that period of time. While stocks were plummeting and then bouncing back, the bond market was just sort of bumping along, marginally getting higher, uh, you know, day over day, week over week, month over month. This is another illustration of how bonds and stocks uh, move very often in different directions or move independently of one another. Yes, as we say here, the smart, smart asset allocation can protect against losses, but can your clients avoid the panic sell? That's the key. When the stock market drops down to that low level, a lot of clients want to panic, cut, and run. So the question is, 
if they are invested in stocks, if you are invested in stocks and you have this significant downturn, what will you do? Will you want to panic, sell, and get out? Or do you have another plan in place? And that is really the goal of the, the, uh, the financial advisor, to help you to determine what is the plan that you should have in place, whether the stock market's going up or the stock market's going down. So what I want to show is this is, um, this is actually a, a, a chart of the S&P 500. Uh, this was back at the end of 2018. We had a significant drawdown in the fourth quarter. And normally clients, uh, or very often, we saw a lot of clients who wanted to, to get out of their stock position at that time. If they get out of the stock position at that, uh, you know, when, when the markets drop, what they're doing is they're locking in their losses and they may not know when to get back in. Wouldn't it be great if there was a, uh, um, a type of investment that would allow investors to get out of the market when volatility is picking up and the markets are starting to weaken and then get back in when the markets are starting to strengthen again. Uh, and uh, so it would take the guesswork out of it for clients and also provide a smoother experience along the way. Well, we do have such a thing, and we'll, we'll talk about that more uh, in, the, in the coming minutes. Um, and a graphical representation of what that would look like is as follows. Go ahead and advance the slide if you would. So imagine there's a position that basically gets out where that dotted red line is, misses a good chunk of the, of the downturn after that, also, in, in fairness, misses a good chunk of the rebound from the bottom, but then gets back in uh, you know, uh, at some time, allowing the, the experience of the dotted line for the investor, which in this hypothetical example is, a, uh, is higher than uh, that, that uh, dark blue line. In other words, have some kind of systematic investment strategy that would allow investors to stay in the strategy and allow the strategy to de-risk and then re-risk based on market conditions. We're going to talk about a strategy that is designed to do just that. Let's move to the next slide, please. So, Brooks, do you want to tee this up? Yep, perfect. Well, I, I feel teed up. That was a very uh, well-transitioned slide there, Tony. Um, <laughs> so, joking aside, um, we very intentionally uh, built the beta shield strategies based on some of those fundamental concepts uh, that we just discussed. Um, to kind of help, uh, as Tony mentioned, help to the end investor have a smoother ride through some some volatile uh, volatile times in the market. Um, so again, you know, we want to reiterate that um, you know it's not a solic solicitation to sell. You should set up a call with Logan just to talk about beta shield, how it works, how it might fit into your financial plan. Um, if it makes sense for you. Um, so there's three main components to the beta shield models um, that we wanted to address when we constructed these. Um, you know, simply losing value in your portfolio or the loss of capital. Um, you'll you'll hear, hear us refer to this as drawdown um, quite frequently. Um, the second, you know, lack of upside potential. This relates more to being being overly or too conservative in your portfolio and not having the ability uh, to achieve the expected returns when the markets are heading north or going up. Um, and then the fourth, or sorry, the third one, and really most importantly, in my opinion, um, I see this all the time when I'm talking to our advisors. Um, it's one of the biggest things that, that pains me to see um, is when investors do participate in one of two things. Either it's that panic sell, like Tony just talked about. Um, you really always see it towards the bottom of the market. The market's already down 20, 30, even 40%, and the clients panic and they sell everything and go to cash. And then they freak themselves out and get too scared. And they finally feel like it's a good time to buy again after everything looks rosy and the market has recovered a substantial amount. Um, you know, I think a lot of it's driven by the news media. Um, so that's why, again, I really encourage working with a professional financial advisor. Um, two really good recent examples of this, in my opinion, are with the cryptocurrency um, phenomenon a couple of years ago. Um, you saw with Bitcoin run way, way up 
every was all over the news. Everyone got excited about it. Um, I'm sure a lot of retail investors probably lost a good chunk of change. And then more recently with the marijuana stocks, um, all over the news, had a huge run up before the news started really talking about it. And then um, you've seen kind of what's happened to that industry over the last year or so. It's really come uh, kind of come crashing down. Um, so let's move on here. Um, so this is uh, another one of the, the things I hear a lot when talking to advisors is you have a client come into your office and everyone wants full participation in the upside of the equity markets um, when they're going up, but they want no exposure when they're going down. Um, the unfortunate truth of that is that that is not possible to participate in all the upside and none of the downside. Um, so we wanted to put together uh, something that did cater uh, to that mindset, um, but do it in a much more systematic and intentional way. Um, what we can do again is implement a strategy that can give you protection against large, more catastrophic losses on the downside, like a 2008 financial crisis, um, what we've experienced early this year, um, but also providing you the opportunity to have a more aggressive allocation and participate more fully during periods of a prolonged uptrend in the market, um, like some of the periods from, let's say, 91 to 99, 2002, 2007, and most recent bull market from 2009 to 2019. Um, so these are the main principles that we took into consideration when we developed the beta shield strategy. Um, it's a series of investment models that you can invest in through your financial advisor. Um, so Tony's gonna walk us through some of these details uh, and how this series of strategies is constructed and managed. Great, thanks Brooks. Let's talk a little bit about what it is and what it's not. So it's a disciplined risk mitigation strategy. It wants to, it's designed to mitigate large losses in the markets, catastrophic losses. It also seeks to capture the upside in equity markets and it is liquid and it is transparent. You can uh, see um, when it's hedged, when it's not hedged, you can, you can move in or move out of it anytime you like. Um, what it isn't, it's not a timing strategy. It's not, you know, we, us putting our finger to the wind and saying, gee, I believe it's time to sell today. Um, it's a very disciplined, um, uh, algorithmically driven uh, 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 algorithm, uh, algorithmically driven trading strategy, excuse me. Um, it's not a guarantee. There is, there are potential losses uh, investing in this strategy. It is not always uh, de-risked or hedged. It's not a liquid, nor is it a black box. We try and be as transparent as possible. And it's not a protection against acute or quick gap risk, such as the, uh, you know, the, the flash crash or the, uh, the, the um, Black Monday of October 8th, 1987. Um, so there are risks associated with the strategy and it's important to know what those are. So essentially we've got, uh, this is an example of the um, kind of the three broad um, uh, portfolios we have on the left and two more narrowly focused portfolios on the right. There's the fundamental, the opportunity and the global equity strategies. And um, they, uh, they essentially have different uh, loss targets, maximum loss targets. Um, and they are um, essentially built in such a way so as to be tailored to the individual's uh, comfort level as it relates to uh, losses. The fundamental strategy typically has 65% in the stock market, 35% in the bond market. The opportunity strategy typically has 85% in the stock market, 15% in the bond market. And the global strategy, global equity has is 100% equities typically. We also have two more narrowly focused equity strategies on the right side. That's the U.S. equity strategy and the international equity strategy. The point is they have a, uh, a targeted maximum uh, drawdown and they are algorithmically driven to de-risk the portfolios uh, as the markets weaken and the portfolios are in jeopardy of um, losing substantial amounts. Remember, these are designed with the goal of protecting against catastrophic losses in the market. 
what are the components of Beta Shield? Well, they're fundamentally comprised of global asset allocation portfolios. They have a loss tolerance that's built in, and that loss tolerance is generally measured over a 12-month time period. And then there's a ratchet function. So when the portfolio value increases, the ratchet function ratchets up with that uh, new higher value. How does the ratcheting function work? Well, in this example, we show a starting value of $100. Um, and the uh, portfolio moves up to $105. The ratchet takes place. And from the original $100, this portfolio would have, uh, in protecting against a maximum uh, drawdown of 15%, would have said $85 is the floor. But then when we ratchet up to the $105 level, 15% from that is 89.25, that's the new floor. Then as the portfolio moves up to $110 in value, 15% 15 below that, the new floor is 93 and a half. So this shows that as the portfolio gets higher, ratchets kick in and the new floor in terms of the maximum target drawdown gets higher and higher. How does the risk mitigation strategy work? Well, here's a simple illustration that shows um, uh, strategy is uh, on, on the left, the, uh, the beta shield risk mitigation component is off. This is a, a bull market. This is an example of you know, stocks going up. It's uh, 72 degrees and mostly sunny outside in the capital markets. Everything's just fine. Then volatility hits around the middle of the slide. Markets start to decrease. You see that um, the portfolio begins to de-risk as represented by that, um, that uh, blue wedge in the donut. Uh, and then if the market keeps going down, it de-risks again, represented by that half of blue donut. And then if it keeps going down, it de-risks again, as represented by that three quarter size wedge uh, in, in the donut. So the point is, um, when markets are going up, the beta shield strategy remains fully invested in the markets. And when markets are going down and past certain thresholds and certain trigger points, the portfolio will begin to systematically de-risk. Uh, real life example for our beta shield strategies, when the markets began to weaken in February of this year, the strategies began to de-risk. Uh, in March, they all reached a 100% de-risked allocation, meaning they were all fully invested in cash, essentially. And more recently, as the markets have begun to rebound from those lows, uh, they have begun to re-risk again, and they're they're currently, uh, as of the sixth of May, uh, primarily invested uh, still in cash with small allocations back to the capital markets. That's a real life example of what we're seeing on that screen. And then this is another uh, illustration of re-risking. Um, I started to talk about uh, the re-risking of the actual portfolios uh, last month in April. Um, on this slide, we begin with a portfolio that has 75% in that blue wedge representing cash. As the markets go up, it goes from 75% uh, blue wedge down to 50% with the other parts of the portfolio beginning to increase in value. Then as it continues to go up, the de-risking component gets smaller and smaller until finally, upper right portion of this slide, the beta shield risk mitigation component is turned off and the client once again is back fully invested in the capital markets. The point of this strategy is not to outperform its benchmark, no. The point of this strategy is to provide a lower volatility experience for the investor and to take the guesswork out of when to re-risk and de-risk the portfolio. Thanks, Tony. Uh, we know that was a lot of information. Hopefully you found it interesting and valuable. Um, we wanted to leave you with several key takeaways that we feel are really the most important if you don't remember anything else from this presentation. Um, so first of all, on the current market situation, uh, governments are taking action around the world to attempt to get economies through this unprecedented and difficult time. Uh, however, the COVID-19 ep epidemic um, and the economic impact of the social distancing environment that we're in uh, it's going to continue to cause headwinds and uncertainty in the markets for the foreseeable future. Um, I think we're going to see that uh, really until we get a treatment or a vaccine for COVID-19. 
Um, so around growing your wealth, you know, it's really want to talk about the importance of having and sticking to a well-crafted and maintained financial plan that is customized for your specific goals and needs. We think that is just a really critical, critically important feature um, in you know, really achieving your long-term financial goals and your overall financial well-being. Um, everyone knows that these types of events are going to happen, uh, but no one can know when they're going to occur or how severe they're actually going to be. Um, after they happen, it's too late to plan for it. You can do um, you know, a, a good job of planning for this type of thing ahead of time by, I would say, working with a professional financial advisor, really understanding what your risk tolerance is and creating a financial plan that caters to um, your willingness to take risk. Um, finally, with the Beta Shield portfolios, um, they offer a, manage, a managed solution to reducing exposure to catastrophic losses in your portfolio while offering participation in the longer term uptrends of the stock market. So um, I hope you took some, some good notes and uh, you know, some good takeaways from that, but you really probably should you know, meet with Logan, um, meet with your financial advisor and you know, help them determine if that could be a good fit for your financial uh, portfolio and your long-term uh, building of wealth. So I wanna thank everybody for the time this evening. Um, we hope it's been educational and you actually learned something that was interesting um, and hopefully valuable about investing and financial planning. So I will turn it back over to Logan here. And again, thank you, everybody. Wow. Thank you, Tony and Brooks. What a great presentation and a great market overview. I'm sure you guys enjoyed that. Very in-depth look at what the capital markets have been doing or what they have done in the past and kind of compared them to recent market corrections or market setbacks, if you will. What a great look. Really appreciate that as well as what a great intro to the beta shield as far as some of you may have heard us talk about the beta shield if you're a client or some of you may have it. And um, this may be a great refresher course for how the details of the beta shield work. But really, if you don't know what the beta shield is or if you've heard of us talk about it but don't know how it really fit in your portfolio, what a great time to take a look and see what options are out there through the beta shield while limiting that, that investment volatility, right? So many of us like the upside of the market. We, get, we call our friends and tell them we're up. But when we see a, a, when the markets get volatile, we're panicked, right? We want to sell off or we want to move around. And what I like about the beta shield is, most importantly, is I feel it takes a lot of the, uh, a lot of the emotion out of the investing, right? You don't have to try to time it. It's doing it for you. And it's not timing the market. What it's simply doing is taking the emotion out of investing and simply relying on the numbers. So what a great... What a great model to have for you if you are one of those jumpy clients, and that's okay. You know, if the market starts to get volatile and you're one of those people where it panics you, what a great option for having the beta shielding is for a portion of your money um, in, in your portfolio because it does such a great job at doing just that, managing your risk. And that's what we love about it so much. And again, AlphaStar has more than just the beta shield. They have a lot of other products offerings that we could bring to you. But we really would just, if you haven't heard us talk about it and we're interested, we appreciate it. If you give us a call, like Brooks said, call Regary Financial's office if you're interested in how AlphaStar's models or how AlphaStar works. Be happy to sit down and go over it with you. We are scheduling uh, Zoom appointments, one-on-one -on -one Zoom appointments, as well as phone calls or phone conferences. And we are scheduling appointments uh, for as soon as we are allowed to get in the office and, and take those one-on-one -on -one uh, in-person appointments. Again, we're looking forward to that. So again, a little recap, we talked about the beta shield, talked about the market, but also we talked about the power of AlphaStar and the power of an advisor. What our roles are, as they explained, is very, it's very simple and very out outlined in di different roles. Me, Hugh, Debbie, uh, our team, we're on the road a lot. We're meeting with clients, we're on the phones, we're doing a lot of this and that with your clients. So we miss a little bit of what goes on during the market day, or we may miss what goes on a little bit during the market day, and if a client calls and has a question about oil or about something we don't we haven't heard that day or that minute, what a great what a great backline of defense Alpha Star is and has been for us as far as they that's their job that's what they're watching every day they are knowing what exactly seg what sectors are doing what because they manage these models they're watching them so Alpha Star is more of the back end they handle the investment management as well as the compliance end of the investment management our job is to meet with the clients really sit down and get a real feel. 
for what your goal is. What is your goals and what your concerns of your investment portfolio? And what are you trying to accomplish? That to me is probably the most important thing. What is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? Now, fear comes up as far as market volatility. That's when the beta show may be something great for you. So please, if you guys are interested in it at all, again, give the Gary Financial Office a call. Be happy to show you what we got over here with Alpha Star Capital Management. We appreciate your time. Uh, Tony Brooks, I appreciate your time as well. We're Gary Financial is, again, super happy with Alpha Star and you guys. And uh, first off and last off, um, hope you guys are all staying safe. We know it is a very volatile time, not only with the market, but our emotions. So uh, stay safe. Hope you and your family are doing well. If you need anything, give a Gary Financial call. We'd be happy to help you out. All right, stay safe.